everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Metabolomics and its role in precision medicine, presented by Dr. John Riles. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, go to labroots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, but if we're unable to get to your question, they will be answered via email following the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. Now, if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window, or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located on the lower left hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Riles. Dr. John Riles co-founded Metabolon Incorporated in 2002 and serves as president and CEO. Metabolon is a pioneer and leader in the field of metabolomics and its use in precision medicine and human health. Prior to Metabolon, he was a co-founder, CEO, and president of Paradigm Genetics Incorporated, a publicly traded agricultural biotechnology company focused on industrializing the process of gene function discovery. Dr. Riles has 30 years experience in the biotechnology industry, including senior research positions at Novartis and Siba Gaibi. He currently serves on the board of directors at AgBiome, a provider of early stage R&D for agriculture and the advisory board of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. He earned a BA in biology and chemistry from the University of North Texas and MS and PhD degrees in molecular biology from the University of Texas at Dallas. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Riles. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Dr. Riles? Okay, uh, thank you, Christine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, Christine. So today, uh, what I'd like to talk about is what we're doing at uh, Metabolon and how we're developing uh, metabolomics technology and using that really in helping to understand better how uh, the genome is, is functioning, but also how, you know, how to better look at human health and, and disease. And, you know, what we try to do at Metabolon is measure all of the small molecules in a sample all at the same time. And so if you want to put this in context, if you're looking at DNA or genomics and you're trying to understand DNA structure, you're trying to understand the mutations in, in a person or an individual, uh, you know, what you're getting then is data on the risk of an event actually happening. You know, not all mutations are penetrant. Uh, they don't all, all actually cause anything to happen. Uh, and so you're getting a risk assessment. And what we do at Metabolon is look at the small molecules that comp comprise a metabolism. And so when things are happening, uh, you know, when the genes are causing differences or when you uh, have developed a disease, what you're actually changing are the small molecules. And that's what, what we can comprehensively measure. So the way we do this is through a mass spectrometry method. Uh, we use a number of different methods uh, to analyze a sample because these molecules are very diverse. Uh, no one mo method is going to measure everything. Uh, and the trick to the technology, you can't just buy a mass spec and do what we do at Metabolon. You know, what, what you'll end up getting is huge amounts of data that you're not going to be able to interpret. And just to give you an example, if we take a water sample and run it through these various processes, uh, we'll create about 40,000 data points per sample. And those, those data points are called ion features. So that's your noise level. That's how much noise is coming through the system. And it's coming from things like plasticizers through contaminants of solvents, things like that. If we run a plasma sample through this system, we'll create about 43,000 data points. And so the whole trick to this is data processing and how do you separate signal from noise. And to approach that, we come at this mathematically and through a data processing method. We've written about 2 million lines of software code 
where we collect that information off of the detector in the mass spectrometer. And then from every, every manipulation or every calculation of the data that's done after that is done in our software environment. And so very quickly we can go from a very heavily noisy um, data set to eliminate that noise, zero in on the signal, and then uh, associate those uh, data points to the actual molecules they represent, uh, and then organize that into very uh, organized ways of looking at the data. Uh, and so very quickly we can go from a very noisy sample to a very ordered set of molecules and we can understand pathways that are being involved in the disease. Uh, and we can use that information to interpret not only why we're seeing certain changes in metabolism, but how that links to physiology. And we've backed that up over the past 15 years with about 5,000 independent studies. Uh, we've uh, run studies on all kinds of different human diseases, all kinds of t types of samples. And we've been able to then piece together the overall metabolism and how that really relates to uh, physiology. So it's not just getting the biomarkers or getting the molecules, but it's also understanding what they do. Now, when we take that data from uh, what we'd call our global platform and we combine it with data that we can get off our com complex lipid methods, and I should say we developed a, an instrument called the Lipidizer. We co-developed that with AB SciX. Uh, and it can measure about a thousand lipids in a blood sample. So uh, by combining those two data sets and looking at a blood sample, say a plasma sample in humans, uh, we can measure about 2,000 molecules that are being maintained homeostatically uh, in the plasma in a healthy person. Uh, so if you, um, and, and among those molecules are going to be about 250 molecules that are derived from bacterial metabolism. And so as humans, we have outsourced about 10% of our total metabolic capability to the bacteria in our intestines or in our gut, and that's what the gut microbiome does. It actually makes these molecules that humans don't make very well, and, and so we need those, and, and those are actually made by your bacteria but maintained homeostatically in your body. And when these things, when your bacteria get out of sync or when you aren't making certain of these molecules, you become you can become quite diseased. And so very, very important parts of metabolism are in this, are, are represented by the gut bacteria, including things like your brain chemistry. So, so these are the types of things that we can measure. Now, this, is, this slide is just demonstrating the development of the technology. And over uh, the past 15 years, we've gone through four wholesale changes of instrumentation as the instrumentation got better and better. Uh, we now have a platform, our basic technology is on what are called accurate mass instruments, uh, where we can get down to a measurement of a 10,000th of a Dalton. Uh, and throughout this whole process, we were improving the software and improving the mathematics. And so everywhere you see an arrowhead on that timeline is a new software package that we had to write, or an application, or deriving algorithms. And what we were trying to do during that period, you can see down in the lower left corner in that panel, is we were trying to improve the overall precision of the technology. So uh, we run quality control samples on every instrument every day, and we can take that data over a year, and we can understand what was the total pro process uh, variance uh, in, in a sample uh, throughout a whole year. And you can see from this inset in 2015, our total process variance was about 4.5%. And in that point in time, we are measuring about 2,000 molecules. And so it is a very highly precise technology. And to put that in context, if you're uh, measuring a uh, blood sample through LabCorp or Quest, uh, they shoot at being able to have a total process variance of about 10%. Uh, they often return data at 15 to 20%. Uh, and so you can kind of put that in context. We're much better than a clinical diagnostic precision. And that's what now has opened up our ability to look at uh, precision medicine. So basically, uh, what we're doing is we're screening through uh, human biochemistry, and this is one of our maps of, of uh, human biochemistry. It's been curated for reactions that happen in humans. Uh, and we're looking for the area of metabolism that is, is being affected in a particular experiment or in a disease. And now, what, so that's the basic technology. And now what I'm going to do is switch over to some applications that we've developed over the years uh, to show you some of the uses and in, um, in, in how, how we have, have used it to work. Uh, and so this first study I'm going to explain was a collaboration between uh, our group at Metabolon 
uh, researchers led by uh, Carson Suri uh, at Helmholtz Institute in Munich and by Timothy Spector uh, at King's College in London. Uh, and the question on this technology or this, this approach, this case study was, you know, could we map allelic variants of DNA, could we map these mutations to changes that they might cause in biochemistry? And so to answer that question, we had two, uh, two large uh, population studies uh, with the Munich group, we had 1,768 individuals. Uh, with the King's College group, we had 1,056 individuals. And they had what at the time, and this was about five or six years ago, was a saturation SNP analysis uh, with six, between 650 and 550,000 SNPs uh, on each person. There was an overlap of those two databases, or two data sets of about 450,000 data points. So, you know, we had pretty good saturation uh, SNP uh, coverage throughout the genome. And what we were looking for is could we draw an association between those allelic variants and changes that happened in metabolism in the blood. And to do that, to be called a positive, you would have to get an association that was above a bond peroni correction in both data sets. And so it had to be positive in the uh, German group and positive in the uh, British group. And in doing that study, we came up with about 37 uh, associations. And we published this in Nature a number of years ago. And about half of those associations were to uh, previously unknown gene functions. And so they were mapping uh, orphan genes that no one had known what that gene had done before we, were, we had run this study. And, um, and that may seem like a small number. It actually seems like a very large number to me. And my logic would be that in order to, to be uh, scored positive, your allelic frequency in uh, both a German population and in a British population is going to have to be quite high. So not, you can't have an allele that's just in a German population or just in a British population uh, because it won't show up statistically in both. And then on top of the allelic frequency, you have to have an allelic effect that's very high because we're not going to see that allele very often. And so the effect that it makes on metabolism is going to have to be high. So I was surprised that we actually had 37. And if you go into this paper and into the supplemental data, and there's about 100 pages of supplemental data behind this publication, uh, you can see that there were about 200 of these associations that did not get above the statistical cutoff. But we knew that a lot of them were correct because we knew what some of those genes did. You know, they had been identified genes. And so we knew we were mapping to allelic variants and known genes, and we just weren't getting above the cutoff. And so uh, what we all deduced from that was we needed to, to, to test more people. And so in a follow-up study that was published a couple of years ago, uh, we were able to extend that to 8,000 subjects. Uh, and now we were able to get those numbers up to 145 associations. And among those 145 genes, uh, 80 of them were actually new genes that we didn't have a previous function for. So this is a way, you know, we were seeing that this is a way to effectively map gene function. And really, now in this experiment, and you can see this in the supplemental uh, now, uh, data behind this paper, that there were 2,000 associations that didn't get above the statistical cutoff. And we know that a lot of those were right because we know what those genes do. Uh, and we knew that we were actually mapping a lot of other genes. But again, we're being limited by the population that we're testing. And so in the past year, we've run 50,000 patients. We've done two things, actually. We run 50,000 patients, and that analysis is going on now, and we think we're going to really push this association very high. Uh, theoretically, we probably need to do 500,000 individuals in order to get all the genes mapped in humans, but uh, this is going to uh, really change what we know about biology. The other thing we've done, and this was in collaboration with Human Longevity and Craig Venter's group, uh, and also Tim Spector's group at King's College, is they went in and did whole genome sequencing on the entire uh, twins cohort, uh, and we remeasured all those twins, and we pushed this number of 145 to about 300. And why that has gone up is because now we're not limited to the SNPs that we're seeing on SNP chips. We're actually mapping allelic variants that aren't on SNP chips. And so it becomes a much denser uh, data set of, of allelic uh, frequency. And so then that paper is uh, submitted uh, now, and uh, we expect it to be published this year. 
So we believe that you know testing enough people uh, in this in this approach we'll be able to map pretty much every gene in humans that has anything to do with metabolism, which is going to be uh, uh, quite a lot of them. And so basically the conclusions from that is you can measure allelic differences in individuals, and those will cause metabolic variations in subjects, and and you can use this as a mapping technique. And so we're very excited about where this is headed, and we're applying this now to large population studies in various countries, uh, and we think that we could hit that number of 500,000 in, in a few years. So, you know, that's one type of application. And as we were developing uh, this analysis, uh, we also started working with Art Bogdat's group at Baylor College of Medicine. And at the time, Art was the chair of the Department of Genetics at Baylor. And Art is a very well-known uh, scientist in inherited metabolic disease. So he's, he's essentially edited the, tech, edited the textbook on uh, inherited metabolic disease that is used uh, throughout the world in medical schools. And, um, and what Art has spent most of his career on is, is really understanding uh, the inborn errors of metabolism in inherited metabolic disease. And to understand this problem, you've got to go back more than 100 years. And so in 1909 uh, in London, uh, Archibald Garrett, uh, working at St. Bart's uh, Hospital, uh, proposed that there would be changes in the individual, changes in individuals in their chemistry that would then lead to disease. And he called that inborn errors of metabolism. And that little box is actually the front page of his paper. Uh, and that was a very uh, forward-thinking uh, paper. It's a fantastic paper if you ever want to go back and read that. Uh, but those inborn errors of metabolism and the work that was done over the next 100 years has led to uh, uh, testing of every uh, child in the developed world, or almost every child in the developed world, for these types of problems. Because in these inborn errors, they're reasonably rare diseases, but if you can identify the disease early, you can intervene, and you can stop the development of a lot of very serious uh, clinical problems. And so these babies are typically at birth. They uh, are given a hill prick test, so they put a little blood spot on, the, on a card and send that into a public health care lab. Uh, and then if the uh, public health care lab believes they have a positive, they will refer that patient to a genetics department like Baylor College of Medicine if you're in Texas. So there's, just to give you an example, there are 39 public health labs in the United States that do this, uh, typically run by states. And there's about 150 genetic centers that these cases get referred to. And Art's problem is that if he gets a case uh, over the years they've done the analysis on this, and it costs about $5,000 to $10,000 to get a diagnosis on a patient, and it can take a long time, uh, which is not a good thing, and uh, it can take a lot of sample. And so it's, it's hard to get a lot of sample from, um, from a diseased child. So, um, you know, we, we thought we could do better, and he thought we could do better. And so we set up a study, and in this study he sent us 200 patients, <clears throat> and he sent us blood and urine, and then these, these patients were blinded to us. And what uh, Art said is they're all confirmed patients. Uh, some of them don't have a disease. Uh, some of them do have a disease. Uh, and what he wanted us to do is identify those that were diseased versus those that were healthy, uh, and then tell him what disease they had. And so uh, that was our challenge. And we, did, we took on that study, and in fact, we were able to do very well on it. Uh, of those 200, we called all 70 unaffected cases as being unaffected, and we uh, called 129 diseases of 130 correctly, correctly as well. <clears throat> and the only case that we missed was a patient who was currently on therapy and his disease was being uh, treated. And it was effectively being treated. The patient didn't have any symptoms and his metabolism was being maintained uh, okay. So effectively, we, we called every case correctly. Um, if you, this is a, a slide that shows those types of diseases. So in that original study, there were about 29 different types of diseases. And for example, with 3MCC, there were only four cases of 200 that we saw. We called all four cases correctly, and we didn't call anyone else with a disease that uh, didn't have the disease. And so it was 100% sensitivity and specificity. Now, the way we could do this is by understanding metabolism. And so what we did with that data set is we created a, a data set of the 200 patients, and 
we uh, could establish a mean for the concentration of every molecule that we were measuring, uh, and then we could establish what the standard deviation away from the mean was. And then we could take the patients, and for every molecule, we would give a, a numerical score for every molecule that was outside one and a half standard deviations from the mean. Uh, and then what we could do is start valuing pathways. And so we could add up those values of molecules in a metabolic pathway and then score the pathway. And then we could roll those pathways up into bigger pathways and finally into super pathways to get an answer on what was happening with the patient. And this is a, a typical result. So this is a single patient's data. And these are the super pathways of human biochemistry. And so what you're looking at is this patient is normal in everything except for nucleotide biosynthesis. And if we go to the uh, pathways that comprise nucleotide biosynthesis, uh, he actually, this patient is affected in every one of them. And uh, we can then look at all the other pathways uh, of metabolism, and it's actually all, only those pathways that lead into nucleotide biosynthesis that this patient is being affected in. And when we look at the molecules, that is causing this to happen. Uh, these are the molecules here. Uh, and the only thing that comes in common of all these molecules and pathways is the enzyme thymidine phosphorylase. And so from this type of a sort of mathematical analysis, you could identify that the uh, mutation or the child had to be defective in thymidine phosphorylase. And in this case, it had been proven through sequencing that he was. Uh, and so this was a, you know, a positive call. Now, we needed to make this easier, uh, and so what we did is develop a visualization technique for this. <clears throat> and this is looking at a disease patient's data, and we've got this now cast onto a map of human biochemistry. And so this map has been uh, highly curated for only pathways that exist in humans, whereas a lot of the maps, they're about, uh, most of those map sources are at least 5 to 10 percent wrong. Uh, they have pathways in them that do not exist in humans. So we've gone through all of that and really curated what is in humans and what's not. Uh, and that's what you're looking at here. And now the visualization works this way. So if you have a colored circle, uh, the molecule is at least one and a half standard deviations away from the mean. If it's up, it's got a red circle. Uh, and if it's down, it's got a blue circle. Uh, and then the size of the circle <clears throat> is proportional to the number of standard deviations away from the mean. And so you can see various sizes there. Now, one and a half standard deviations, if you think of a Gaussian curve, 20% of your values are going to be outside of one and a half standard deviations. So you're going to be seeing a lot of noise. And that's what you're seeing through here. And we wanted to be able to see that baseline of noise in order to be able to value whether a signal was actually coming through. And, and so what you're seeing here is the basic noise of the metabolism in this patient. And when you look up in that upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, you see a bigger cluster of, of changes. And when we bring this up, this is actually branch chain, key, uh, branch chain amino acid uh, catabolism. And so you're looking at leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and how they're being catabolized in this patient. And we're accumulating all the molecules above this rectangle and we're decreasing the molecules below that. And uh, that rectangle is representative of the enzyme branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase. Uh, and it's well known that a mutation in that enzyme can cause the disease maple syrup urine disease. And so this is a uh, representation of maple syrup urine disease patient. And every time <coughs> we see that disease, we're going to see this pattern. Now, the reason that's important is because there are a lot of mutations in that enzyme that can cause this disease. And they, those mutations vary uh, in their penetrance, they vary in their time uh, at when they're going to present, and they vary at their severity. But no matter how they vary, they're going to look like this, this pattern. And so we can think of these now changes as being variables, and we can take those variables and um, assign them values uh, and then derive equations about that. And this would be a typical disease score equation uh, for maple syrup urine disease. And these, these equations, since they're multivariate, uh, become very, very sensitive for the disease and very, very specific. And so we don't really even have to visualize the data. We can run the equations through the data uh, and be able to um, identify these patients with 100% sensitivity and specificity and we're much more sensitive than existing technologies. 
And so what that has led to, to a development of a product, we developed this, co-developed this with Baylor. Uh, we call it MetaIMD. At Baylor, they call it Global Maps. Uh, and uh, what MetaIMD does is we can take a small sample from a patient, about 100 microliters of blood plasma, and we can now assess about 65 different diseases in that one sample. And we can do that within about 10 days. And we hope eventually to get that down to five. But even at 10 days, <clears throat> that's very quick for being able to reach a diagnosis on these patients. And so what you're seeing here is a patient, and they're within a normal range on all of these pathways that are green. Uh, and the one pathway that they're out of the normal range is shown there when you kind of blow that up. <coughs> That disease is arginemia, and um, if you flip to the next page, this is what arginine, this is what the patient looks like, that they've got very high expression on certain molecules, very low expression on others, uh, and this is the pathway that's being affected, and it's very clear uh, to the people that study inherited metabolic disease that this would be arginemia. And so uh, this is a product that we're now offering to uh, the genetic labs across the country that do this follow-up diagnosis. Uh, we're also going to move this into pediatric care uh, uh, later. You know, we're trying to get the genetic groups on uh, first. So this is a typical thing that you can do with the technology. Uh, and there are a number of these types of diseases. We think we can get this list of diseases up to about 200 within the next year or two. Um, and so it's going to be a fantastic way of really taking a small sample and being able to assess whether uh, they might have a disease. And this is important. I mean, people think you could do just DNA sequencing, but the DNA sequencing data can be very ambiguous and for several reasons. And even though, like, if you took an uh, enzyme like uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase that causes PKU, we know there's 222 alleles that have been uh, proven to cause that disease in phenylalanine hydroxylase. Some of them cause a very severe form of the disease. Some cause a very weak form of the disease. Uh, sometimes the penetration is early in life, sometimes it's going to be later in life. And then there's 3,000 alleles that are possible that are beside those 222, and we don't know what they do. And that's either because possibly they've been embryonic uh, defective, and so you didn't have a baby result from that mutation, or they could be just silent mutations and they don't do anything, or they could just be not well characterized. And so the sequencing data can be quite ambiguous, but the actual metabolic data is, is quite specific. Uh, so that's, a, that's another type of use of the technology. And then in, in kind of the last case study I'm going to show is coming from Tom Kasky and his, his colleagues at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, and what our, our plan with uh, Tom was is he published a, a paper on the Young Presidential uh, Organization cohort about three years ago where he did whole exome sequencing on 80 individuals that were self-reported healthy. And I think their finding rate was about 15% of those patients had a genetic issue that needed to be brought to the attention of the patient and brought to the attention of the physician. Uh, and that was a really cornerstone pa paper now for the use of genomic uh, data in patient care. And so Tom sent us those 80 patients, again, blinded. And, and the challenge here was could we, um, could we find anything in that patient cohort that wasn't found genetically? And so we looked through those 80 patients. And one of the patients, this is patient 3905. In this patient, uh, you can see the data. The open circles are the spread of those 80 patients in the data. The, the red is the actual patient we're discussing here. And this patient has very high levels of sorbitol and high levels of fructose. And this would be indicative of a genetic disorder called fructose intolerance. And fructose intolerance is caused by a mutation in the albulase B gene. And so, you know, our interpretation of this patient was, okay, we picked up a fructose intolerant patient, uh, so there should be a corresponding mutation in albulase B. So we went back to Tom and asked him if that actually was the case. Uh, and he couldn't find it being reported to him in the data. And that's when we started digging into, okay, what do physicians get to see in the data? And so what had happened is they'd run a series of algorithms through this data, uh, and uh, aldolase B just wasn't considered, it wasn't deemed to be an important mutation. Uh, and actually it wasn't even reported as a mutation. So we went back, and, and Tom went back to the original sequencing data, they looked at the aldolase B gene, and there was, in fact, a mutation. 
it was actually a very conserved mutation, so it was a change from an isoleucine to a valine, which most people would think wouldn't do anything. Uh, and so there was a mutation there. The computer program had just rendered it to be benign, and so it wasn't being reported. Even though that mutation has never been seen in the history of science, it was rated by the programs as benign. So they called the patient back in. This was a female, uh, kind of middle-aged, and started uh, asking her about her medical history. You know, they asked her if she was uh, fructose intolerant. She said she didn't know what that meant. Uh, and then they asked her if she ate certain kinds of fruits and laid out what those fruits were. And she said, oh, no, I couldn't eat those fruits. You know, they cause uh, severe abdominal distress when I eat something like that. It's been happening since I was a child. That's fructose intolerance. And so here what we have is the metabolism able to pick up a genetic disorder that's actually been missed by uh, the DNA sequencing and the computer programs. Actually, the sequencing saw the mutation, and it just didn't value it as being important. So that's one type of patient we had. This is another patient example. So this is 3923. And in this case, we didn't have a medical finding on this patient at all. But uh, Tom came back and said, well, there must be a mistake because the, the uh, DNA sequence is showing a deleterious mutation in xanthine dehydrogenase. And it's saying that this is a disease allele, uh, and it should be causing xanthinuria. <clears throat> now, if you had xanthinuria, you would have very high levels of hy hypoxanthine and xanthine uh, and very low levels of urate. And that's really not what you're seeing in this patient. So this patient looks totally normal. Uh, and so we went back and, and asked Tom the question, you know, well, why, do you, why is this patient being reported? And this is actually the CM128354 is the allele um, number that uh, the patient had. Uh, we went back into the literature to look at why that was considered as a mutation. And it all comes back to a single publication and a single patient that's being reported. And so there's really not, um, not a high degree of confidence that we actually, number one, have a, disease gene, uh, have a disease mutation or that we understand anything about its penetrance. And so uh, in the meantime, Tom's uh, collaborators went back to that patient. They isolated the enzyme xanthine dehydrogenase and could show that it was perfectly active. And so uh, this is another type of uh, thing where we're looking at biochemistry. We're able to either confirm or disconfirm uh, whether an allele is penetrant. Uh, and we will be coming out in the next year uh, working with Tom and working with HLI, showing that uh, hundreds of cases of this, where we have a putative mutation and we've been able to show it e either is penetrant to the metabolism or it's not penetrant to the metabolism. And so we think this is going to be another use of the technology that's going to be very important as we start to progress through uh, kind of genomic medicine. Now, we were also picking up things that weren't genetically uh, determined or probably weren't genetically determined. And so these are two patients. And what we have here is evidence of acetaminophen-induced liver toxicity. And so acetaminophen is Tylenol. Uh, since we're measuring all the molecules in a sample, uh, we see all these changes. And these, this upper set of panels are the metabolites of acetaminophen. Uh, and you can see that these patients are very high in their levels of acetaminophen metabolites. If you get down to the second bracket of measurements, these are secondary bile acids. And so in our work with about 70 different patient cohorts in liver disease, the secondary bile acids are actually the earliest and best indicator of the onset of liver disease. And what you see is in patient 3958, you really don't see any indication of liver disease looks pretty normal. Uh, and in patient 3976, he's starting, this patient is starting to display liver disease. And if you drop down to that last line, that's glutathione. And the protective mechanism in the liver uh, to protect against acetaminophen toxicity is the accumulation of glutathione. And in patient 3976, where the showing signs of liver disease, he's depleted in glutathione. Uh, in 3958, where he's actually protecting against liver disease, he has very high levels of glutathione. And so this is the actual reason why uh, we're seeing this difference. Uh, both of these patients were called in, you know, during the study and, you know, asked the question, do you take Tylenol? They both said no. Uh, they were asked if they take acetaminophen. Uh, they both said no. And then they were shown the uh, placard that's in a lot of doctor's offices of all the over-the-counter products that contain acetaminophen. And they were both taking Tylenol at night to help them, I mean, uh, NyQuil at night to help themselves get to sleep. So 
you know, both of these patients have come off of that now. Uh, and, you know, we're actually in a process of developing disease. And so when you summed up what we were able to see in the patients, we had a 28% hit rate of a medical problem in a self-reported healthy cohort. And so of those self-reported healthies, 28% of them actually weren't that healthy. Uh, and that's where we started understanding that the technology had really gotten to a point and we had tested enough patients and built enough databases that we were actually starting to see uh, basic problems in human health. And so I'll just end with an area where we're heading and that's looking at health and wellness. And so this is a patient, uh, MD, PhD, we're typically still just working with uh, physicians essentially uh, with this technology. We haven't offered this as a product yet, but you can see where we want to head. Uh, we've taken 100 microliters of plasma sample. We've assayed now about 900 molecules in this individual. And relative to a, uh, a population uh, that's relevant for this individual, uh, he's showing signs of early stage chronic disease. Now this patient self-reported as healthy. Uh, we went back to him and said, well, you know, you don't look that healthy. And um, in fact, you know, as we dug into his medical history, he was pre-diabetic. Uh, Pre-diabetics typically think of themselves as healthy. Uh, and we were picking that up with our diabetes markers. This is a score that's derived from about 31 molecules that we know associate to type 2 diabetes. Uh, the showing signs of early stage cardiovascular disease uh, and various other problems. And so, you know, these are the types of things we're now doing with our technology uh, and, you know, where we're headed. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, end. Uh, thank you uh, for watching uh, this uh, webcast and uh, would be happy to entertain questions, I guess. And, um, you know, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm sorry, a little technical difficulty there. You couldn't hear me. I was saying thank you to Dr. Riles for that informative presentation. And before we get started on the question and answer session, I want to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button in the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Okay, Dr. Riles, our first question is, how do I order? How do I order Meta IMD? Any of these tests, especially something like Meta I Meta IMD, um, you really need to go through a physician. Uh, we're a CLIA lab and a CAP-based lab, so we can report uh, information back to physicians. But the physician has to really be the interface with the patient. And so uh, we are, are offering this through a lot of genetic institutions across the country. And so the best thing to do right now is to either contact Baylor directly, which uh, we, we can get those samples through Baylor, or go to your nearest uh, human genetics uh, department, your nearest medical school, or get your pediatrician to do that. Uh, and we, we can get it through those, those groups. Dr. Riles, you've shown that there are about 2,000 molecules that you can measure in humans. I've seen much larger numbers. Why the discrepancy? Investigators not really understanding the difference, for example, uh, between ion features and data points and actually what molecules are. Uh, and so I showed early on that there, even just using our four methods, we can measure at least 160,000 data points. Of those data points, probably only about 10,000 of them represent real molecules. And so uh, I think there's a, a major misunderstanding of what that data represents is coming out of mass spectrometers. Uh, an ion feature does not equate to a unique molecule. Uh, a molecule can present 50 to 100 different um, molecules, I mean, 100 different ion features. So uh, I think it's just a major misrepresentation. Now, we have done a huge amount of research on this number 2,000. And so 
Uh, we've gone through the human genome and we've looked at every enzyme that could possibly uh, cause a biochemical reaction in humans. Um, you know, if you do that and you try to estimate the number of enzymes, you can come up with about 1,500 molecules. Uh, we can go at it through looking at every molecule that's ever been reported homeostatically in a human in medical textbooks and biochemistry books, uh, and we can add those numbers in. And, and what our number represents is the number of homeostatic regulated molecules. And so when people throw out these very large numbers, uh, they may be referring to the fact that not every person is going to have that molecule. Uh, so if you ate something weird one day, uh, you might have molecules in your blood that we don't really see in anyone else. So we wouldn't consider that to be part of human metabolism. That's, that's xenobiotic. Uh, and if you added all the xenobiotic uh, measurements, you might get to those numbers. But those rarely are going to correlate with disease states, especially uh, chronic diseases. And so I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding that's being bannered around by, for instance, my, uh, mass spectrometrists that don't really have a great, great uh, understanding of metabolism. Dr. Riles, can you share with us what's next on the horizon for metabolon and precision medicine? Uh, sure. So that's a great question. So one of the areas that we're really interested, or a couple areas that we're really interested in right now, one is that we think we have a breakthrough in chronic fatigue syndrome, and again, that is a, a disease that uh, affects about three million Americans. Uh, it's characterized by a continuous fatigue state. Uh, we've done some pretty large studies on this, and we believe we now have the uh, actual signature for that, and it actually relates to energy molecules and a depression of energy molecules. Uh, and we can actually get at why it's happening. And so by looking at all the metabolism, we, it's not just that we can see the chronic fatigue, we can actually understand uh, why the metabolism has been perturbed in order to cause that to happen. So. This is something that we're trying to understand, you know, how do we get this out to affected patients? Uh, we think probably by the end of the year uh, we'll have that figured out. Uh, but it's a very interesting and very important area. Uh, we've also been very active in undiagnosed disease. And so undiagnosed disease hits about 6 million Americans, it's estimated. A lot of these are going to be uh, inherited metabolic disorders that have just previously been missed. Uh, we've done a lot of undiagnosed disease patients uh, as well, uh, and I think, you know, we are making breakthroughs in that area as well. And so these are two areas where I'm sure we're going to be able to have an impact, uh, and we're just getting the data assimilated uh, scientifically to, you know, prove that we have medical validity and utility, and then, you know, we'll be offering those types of uh, analysis as well. I'd like to once again thank Dr. John Riles for his presentation and also our audience for their participation. Dr. Riles, do you have any final comments for our audience? Well, yeah, I'd like, I mean, I've just, I think you can tell. I mean, we're all very excited about the technology uh, and where we're headed with metabolomics. We think this is going to be a major. Uh, technological advance in order to understand uh, disease states and, and health and wellness states better. Uh, and we're just very excited about where we've gotten to and where we're headed. So, you know, with that, I thank you all for uh, tuning in uh, and, um, you know, thanks for your attention. Thank you again, Dr. Riles. I would also like to thank our sponsor, LabRoots, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 23rd, 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that to announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We thank you for joining us and hope to see you again. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>